Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to Slightly Books to hear Frances Mays talk about her new book, A Place in the World. Frances Mays is the author of the now classic Under the Tuscan Sun, which was a New York Times bestseller for more than two and a half years and became a touchstone movie star in Diane Lane. Other international bestsellers include Bella Tuscany, Everyday in Tuscany, and A Year in the World. Her books have been translated into over 50 languages, and her most recent books are Seed in the Piazza and Always Italy. We will be wrapping up the event around 7, so I kindly invite you guys to continue the lesson conversations at the beautiful Rusula Patio. And I hope you enjoy, and thank you so much for supporting the local independent bookstore. We're not sure your mic is on. Let me turn it up. Thank you. I hear every word. Hello. Is that better? Oh my God. I will bore you with the intro again, but that's just nice, everyone. Is that good? Yes, better. Is that better? Or is it? Can you hear me way right back there? Yes. Oh, I feel like a little bit more. I think we're maxed out on it. I think obviously we're perfect. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Now good. Shout. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming and for staying here while I was signing. I've never signed before, but it's kind of interesting to do it that way. Um, I. I want to thank Jamie, who's the owner of Bookstore, and all the staff. It's uh, a pleasure to be back in a real space after all these years. Uh, my book, Always Italy, came out in the middle of March, and the, the year that COVID just hit Italy. So the book came out on the very day the bad news started coming in from Italy, and the book just quietly disappeared. <laughs> no one wanted to go to Italy at that point, but now, what's it called, revenge tourism is going on. Everybody suddenly wants to go back again, and including me. I think the Zoom, you know, taught us a few things, but there's really nothing like meeting people at actual place and, and seeing and signing and talking and exchanging so thank you, and I'm really glad to be here. I wanted to just talk a little bit about the genesis of this book. Isn't it pretty? Yes. yes. I love the color. Um, a lot of you probably know the painter John Beerman, and I wanted to use one of John's paintings, but his were all landscapes, and I wanted something that showed an interior. And I love this. He turned me on to this artist, Mel Blaine. She's a Virginia artist. She's no longer with us, but you might want to look up her work because she's quite uh, unknown, I think. And I think this looks like Matisse. I just love it. During uh, that COVID period, just to talk a little bit about the genesis of this book, we were living outside Hillsboro on a farm, it was called Chatwood, it's 1806. It's on the Eno River. We had lived there 12 years and we thought it was like the forever home, although that may sound like a rescue dog, but <laughs> <laughs> we were kind of there for the duration. I thought this place was a world unto itself and that no matter what happened, 
we would always be happy to to be in this place. It was um, quiet. It was idyllic. It rambled. You know, farmhouses ramble the way fires roar. They always ramble, but this one really did. And uh, it seemed like living in an old ship. It creaked in the wind in the winter time, and it was uh, very cozy and full of fireplaces. And we thought when we bought it that it was ours, and we thought we owned it. But during COVID, um, I was planting okra and planting my garden and cooking and reading and doing all this extensive gardening that this place required. And we suddenly started getting the feeling that this house owned us instead of <laughs> us owning it. And so we began to kind of think about um, making a change and it was such a shock. We came to realize later that it was not an original thought. It was happening all over the country. People were moving, they were pulling up stakes, they were going. They didn't want to be where they were anymore. Something about the confinement we were all in just made us realize uh, that it would, might be time to rethink things. So I'm always a traveler. A lot of you have read some of my books about Italy and know that I have been on the road quite a bit. So um, even though I am a traveler, I always have had this extreme obsession with houses and home. So during this time, I was thinking um, that I had this obsession with home. I started looking into my writing and realized that a lot of the writing I had done had been as much about home as it had been about other places. So I started kind of gathering things together that I had written and thinking about what I wanted to write about that I had never written about before. So this is that book, just, just to say, um, we sold the farm, we moved to a small rental house in town, and then we took off for Italy where we've lived for over 30 years now. So um, then we came back and we bought easier place. Not a place as soulful as the farm, but um, more freedom. Um, the questions that arose for me were, why do you stay in a place and, and why do you go? What do four walls mean? Why are you suddenly feeling at home in a place where you are a temporary visitor and it has nothing to do with you? What is this mysterious thing about a momentary place that can feel so familiar to you. And the section in the book called Momentary Homes looks at a few of those places that actually changed my concept of home. One's Mexico, Capri, Provence, um, uh, Venice. And you're, you're in this place for a while and sometimes you realize later you were there at some point of crux in your life that you might not have even known about at the time. But later, when you look back at that place and you see how your mind began to burrow in to that place and you see how it changed you. In the place that feels like home, um, how has that place shaped the people who live there? I wrote about the quirky, marvelous homes of some of my friends here around Hillsboro. I've wanted to do that a long time because my friends there have such wild homes. <laughs> they live in them so fully. And I started thinking about how you love the homes of your friends and how they mean something to you and how your friendship is also partly shaped by them in the place where you know them, where you know them the best. I wrote about um, food as memory in kind of what I hope is a, a deeper way and uh, looked into what the Danes call life food. I asked a lot of my friends about uh, that kind of life food that provokes the most memories uh, for them. And I looked especially at um, 
like Cucina Povera, the poor kitchen in Italy, and how that cooking from necessity in the homes in times where there wasn't much to find in the pantry, how that sparked the most innovative cuisine that, that I can imagine. So all these things were swirling around about what, what means home. It's been a surprise to me that in Italy, which is a country not my own, that I have been so at home myself. So the last part of the book is an expo exploration of why that was true. Um, it's always fortunate for the writer when you surprise yourself with the answers to your own questions. If they, you think you know where you're going with the question you ask yourself, but then I discover it through writing, not through just abstract thought, but in the process of writing around a question, I often come to surprising conclusions that I didn't even predict, and that to me is one of the really big pleasures of writing. Um, what I experience in Italy is um, what it does to you to live in beauty. Um, it's a big question about why I keep restoring houses and what that has to do with my feelings about the future. So one of the big chapters is about stone. I think stone has kind of been the source of my life in Italy because I keep restoring places. And Ed actually, my husband who's right here, is actually, we've been in this big restoration project, the last one, I swear. And, <laughs> um, and we did some new stone walls. We kept getting this exciting feeling that we were doing something important. We were securing that house on that perched hillside for the next 200 years. It's already been there 350, but you know, saving a piece of the patrimony was really important. And uh, we measured the stone walls we've built for the past year and a half. Not we didn't build them, but <laughs> these marvelous stonemasons built them. And it was the length of a football field, a stone wall. Those men worked every day for a year and a half, the same two men putting this wall. And I started visualizing this child a hundred years from now sitting on this stone wall. And that, of course, went in, in, into the book, this casting forward into saving a piece of the patrimony. So that's enough of all the whys. The book was spontaneous. It was really fun to write. And I had the joy of conversation with many writers I love. I've always kept these commonplace books, these books of quotes, and also I stuff prayer cards and menus and maps and all kinds of other things in there. But a lot of this um, inspiration I get while I'm writing is going back into my commonplace books. So I wanted to bring my writer uh, inspirers into the book as well. They were my guides, and I found wonderful quotes from them that showed where I had been thinking about uh, this book for a long, long time. And I just want to read some of them to you because they, they give links to why the book was written. This one's from Maya Angelou. You can never go home again, but the truth is you can never leave home, so it's all right. <laughs> Happiness, not in another place, but this place. Not for another hour, but this hour. Walt Whitman. If adventures will not befall a young lady in her own village, she must seek them abroad. Jane Austen. <laughs> I was not searching for anything or anyone. I was searching for everything, searching for everyone. Octavio Paz. Friendship is all the house I have. William Butler Yeats. The house is the same size as the world, or rather, it is the world. Borges. Everything here seems to need us. Rilke. 
how difficult it is to remain just one person for a house is open, there are no keys in the doors, and invisible guests come in and out at will, just like in Bush. So it was it was a big welcome to me to be able to put these old friends into the book. I'll just read a couple of passages. This is such a big long list. <laughs> Place in the world. My title was The Labyrinth of Home. I hardly ever get to keep my titles. Because, um, like covers and titles have to run through to the publishing company through marketing. And they all thought The Labyrinth of Home, which was from a quote by Borges, was too abstract. So I've got a place in the world that says what it is. It's fine. <laughs> This is, um, some of this book takes place in my taproot sense of home, which was Fitzgerald, Georgia. But this um, short piece is from long after that. The house on South Lee Street. The place is fate. I've always known that. I was driving across the Golden Gate Bridge to my California home when my sister called from Atlanta. DJ, the DJ's house is for sale. Want to make a big offer? Behind his back, we called our grandfather, John Henry Mays, AKA Daddy Jack. We called him DJ the DJ. <laughs> Proud and bossy, he was as far from a DJ as one could get. <laughs> the ancient taproot sense of home suddenly twined through the phone and down my spine. Her friend Dynamite from our South Georgia hometown had called her. In our town, people keep hold of a nickname such as hers, which comes from the time when this lovely matron was just Dynamite as she pranced down the football field as the drum majorette. <laughs> dynamite says it's elegant, a beautiful restoration, that I should buy the old place, come home, and be among my people again. My sister says, I hear the edge of sarcasm in her voice. <laughs> what did you tell her? Laughter. I said that was the last house in the United States I would want to buy. <laughs> the house, as our family called it, symbolized home. My father, Garbert, grew up there. He was called Bufa. When he was a baby, his sister Hazel could not say beautiful. It remains a prime source of my lifelong obsession with homes, interiors, and gardens. Built in 1906, by mid-century, the house already seemed venerable with its wraparound porch, a massive magnolia out front, six fireplaces, and a graceful curving staircase. I love the wide upstairs hall lined with chests full of scrapbooks and brownish photographs my Aunt Hazel's layers of rose and cream taffeta, blue silk and burgundy velvet ball gowns, carefully preserved in tissue for decades after the last bars of the dark town strutter's ball had ended. The big Ben chimes of the clock in the foyer marked time in the big silence of nights when I slept over. The secret bell under my grandmother's foot at the head of the table summoned Fanny Brown with her platters of peppery smothered quail. The scent of the house, cigar smoke, shalimar, damp ashes, fried food, has hit me in various unlikely faraway places and catapulted me again through the back screen door into the celery green kitchen. A mirrored sphere on a pedestal in the yard showed my two-year-old cheeks distorted by the convex ball. Move sideways and see silvery face-sized hydrangeas and the huge oak tree shimmer. In my novel, Swan, I tried to recreate the same sense I felt as a child in my grandparents' home on South Lee Street, a feeling akin to watching animated gold dust in a shaft of sunlight. 
when I was 11, for the entirety of summer vacations at Sea Island, I played over and over a recording of Stephen Vincent Benet's John Brown's body, <laughs> memorizing for wherever the winds of Georgia run, it smells of peaches long in the sun. This, I believe, although the winds in those parts usually carried only the noxious odor of paper mills in Brunswick. His sense of the beauty of the landscape mesmerized me. I loved, too, Sidney Lanier's The Marshes of Gwen and drove my family crazy in the car as I shouted out as the Martian secret builds on the watery sod. Behold, I will build me a nest on the greatness of God. Oh, like the greatness of God is the greatness within the range of the marshes, the liberal marshes of Gwen. In high school, I began to read Flannery O'Connor from over in Milledgeville, Carson McCullers from Columbus, Conrad Aiken born in Savannah, and the far-flung Thomas Wolfe, James A.G., Eudora Welty, and of course, the legendary William Faulkner. In the warp and weft of their books, I found a correspondence to the perception I felt of the intertwining of place and character. I knew the force of the southern landscape, its violent hurricanes and tornadoes, the sun that can scorch your soul, even the uncertain nature of the land itself, where small islands bearing trees float in the swamps, where quicksand could grab your dog, and where the land itself might just drop from under your feet when limestone gave way, creating sinkholes that surged with green water. And that breeze smelling of peaches, even better were the rooms scented with magnolia blossoms, which filled the fireplaces more often than a fire. I loved the sculptural beauty of dogwood choreographing the air and the massive pink azaleas mounted against screen porches. Raising crop dust from plowed and DDT sprayed fields gave us splendid smeared popsicle colored sunsets. On Sunday afternoons when we rode around, I always made my parents stop the car so I could wade in clear running creeks or look over sides of wooden bridges sinking into black water with ghoulish cypress knees growing out of it. I remember reading The Mind of the South and agreeing with W.J. Cash that the Southerner takes the romantic view of the world because the blue air hangs around moss-hung trees. We don't see reality, he thought. Instead, we see a softer world. Literature gave voice to my groping, instinctive ideas. I've kept that knowledge even though I've lived all over the map. In Tuscany, I learned again that a powerful landscape never can be just a backdrop because it's working on you. Sculpting, sculpting you into a shape of its own. When I thought Bonasole in Italy, situated under an Etruscan wall and a Medici fortress, I knew that the house already was home on the hillside. The layers of time were as visible as the layers of ochre, sienna, and rose paint on the crumbling stucco facade. The road below the house is named Strada della Memoria, the street of memory for the cypresses planted for the war dead. The view includes a distant golden villa built in the 18th century for the visit of a pope. He stayed one night. From my place, the villa acts as a still point in the landscape. I can tell time by where the sun hits the facade. Sense of place? I thought the living in my house would be my way into the life in Italy, and that turned out to be right. The house on Lee Street partially burned when I was in college. My grandmother, Frances, was long dead. My grandfather fled the flames in the night and died in shock two days later. Wow. Aunt Hazel had the exterior of the house restored, replacing the gracious wraparound porch with two thin columns. For all my adult life and until Hazel died, 
The shell of the house was maintained on the outside, down to the polished brass knocker and marigolds along the sidewalk. Tacky, my mother said. Marigolds have nothing to do with anything. <laughs> Hazel, on her pilgrimage to the past, rode by and murmured, doesn't the house look good? I announced my engagement to Wilford, to all 12 of my beaux who sat around me on those steps. I roll from my mother, smirk from me at the word beaux. <laughs> Meanwhile, Hazel lived in a tropical tiled house in Miami, which she said always with an explosion of tears would never be home. She had here a Welsh word meaning a feeling for a home that can't ever be revisited or never really existed. Her Spanish Mediterranean home was a thousand times more interesting than her parents' late Victorian but the square white house on the corner of Lee and Lemon had captured her heart and never let her go. Here's the crazy part, the honking part, the unforgettable part, the part that made my sister say, it's the last house in the United States I'd wanna buy. Inside, the house was still burned. The baby grand charred, leaned under a sagging <coughs> staircase. The walls were black and the furniture sticks of glassy ash. I did not write about this in my Southern novel, Swan. The metaphors felt too dense to sort out. I wonder how many small children peered in those windows and ran for their lives. <laughs> One college professor of mine claimed that the Southern sense of place derives from the Lost War. He meant, of course, the war between the states, as it was called then. We are the only people to fight in America for our land and have our land scoured, he proclaimed. We have a sense of loss that never will be overcome. I did not believe him. I felt too shaped by the land itself, not some far off war. I came to the study of history with the conviction that wars are given far too much space in the text. I wanted an explanation, explanation it came from hidden wells, water hyacinths, moonshine, hunting rifles, hat boxes, walking rain, cotton mouths, sheet lightning, scarecrows, lynchings, canopy beds, sinkholes, <coughs> cotton poles, auction humans, palmettos, ether vials, moon vine, and screen doors slamming on a summer morning. A place's icons are what move inside us compel us toward what we are becoming. Living in Tuscany reiterated this primary knowledge. My house became my icon. As it moved into my psyche, it seemed timeless. The house, my oldest playtime, my six window of childhood room, a location for dreaming, the hideouts for sublime or everyday creativity and a chance to be myself in another version. Home, a deep water mooring where you rise and fall. All old houses are full of invisible spirits, benevolent or otherwise. Whatever memories abide, they seep through the floors and into your life. At Bramasole, something real imparts as soon as I return. I feel surges of happiness. I feel profoundly settled at home. Someone bought Mother May's and Daddy Jack's house. I can imagine part pine floors brought from some other room, blue silk at the long windows, the lattice back porch where someone solemn might sit shelling lady bees. Attention lavished on every threshold and when it came, changing the house's fate. The owners, perhaps, will not know everything of its current history. But the disappearing ink of the past always will become visible. The little girl moving her dollhouse into Garbert's old room may, 50 years hence, imagine someone dancing in claret velvet, may prefer hydrangeas to all flowers, or may wake from a panic dream of fire rapidly consuming a curving staircase.
Question. I've often thought my mother said fire through it, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows. I mean, the story was Daddy Jack dropped ash from his cigar. I've always suspected my mother. <laughs> and you kind of see her putting the match under her. <laughs> this is just more of a, of a comment. One of the things that I love about this most recent book that you just read from, is it also seems to be not just a, a meditation on home as, as we see it, but also people and, and feelings and, and what that evokes. And there was one thing that I wrote down that I loved that was actually a quote from Simcoe, the, the French chef who wrote the cookbook along with Julia Child, and that was the are we going to measure or are we going to cook? And that was one thing that really stood out at me. And, and what I'm learning from this book is just living, living and enjoying your life as challenging as things may be right now. I also just wanted to comment on the timing of this book coming out and just thinking what perfect timing it is to read something like this. Yes, I, so many people are re-examining what home is and home became so important because we were behind there so this um, it just came into the forefront instead of being sometimes as it can be in the background that uh, quote she mentioned are we going to measure or are we going to cook is from one of those momentary places uh, in the chapter about places you're briefly you're briefly in but it has some kind of huge impact and it was that I went to uh, south of France to study cooking with uh, Simone Beck, who was Julie Child's partner who had mastered the art of French cooking. And I was really a kind of a crux. I didn't really realize it, but um, I went there and I, I discovered what living in the French countryside was like. It kind of planted a seed that came up a long, late, a long time later, but that was where that originally came from, my idea that I, I wanted to live in a beautiful rural place. And each one of those uh, chapters about that has some kind of little seed that pushed me forward or somewhere, uh, in, even if it wasn't right away. It was really fun to write those. Yes. Do you have one or two favorite gardens? Maybe why gardens in the world of yours? Oh, not in. Oh, the garden at Chatwood was, you know, it was a world class garden a long time ago. And I inherited it from someone who was a passionate gardener. But it's just a, a garden out of time in a way. It was um, 30 acres, five of which were cultivated perennial beds and, and rose gardens. So it was, and plus the vegetable garden, and, you know, the meadows. And it was just, it was so glorious and we loved it for so many years. And then all of a sudden it was like, we've got to do something else. This is taking too much time. There's a line from a Richard Hugo poem, I think it's, it says, the couple was at a party and she looked at him and loved him no more. <laughs> we still love it, still miss it, but it's very nice to have more time. Because I, I realized also during COVID that we couldn't travel and um, felt like a, a lizard with a rock on its tail, <laughs> going this way and this way, but nowhere. But, um, Let's hope that's all behind us, you know? 
There were so many people in Italy this summer, and they were having such a good time. <laughs> I, I think it's, um, it's just so against our nature so to have that kind of vision. Absolutely. Yes. I, I'm really interested in your comments about the fact that you sense a place where you feel at home. I spent much of my life living overseas in foreign service and other government programs. Not always places I chose to go. And I really understand that because there were some places, okay, I got through my three years and I moved on. But I remember I, wherever I lived, when it was time for vacation, I always went to England. And I thought it was because, or Britain, I should say, or the UK. I thought it was because I read all that British literature growing up, and it was, I was an English major, and I absorbed all of that. And then I did my DNA and discovered I'm 96%. Uh, <laughs> no. Britain and Ireland and Scotland and all of that, and it's like ancestral voice. Yes, you know. yes. I wonder how you felt when you decided about, how was it that this is where I want to be? I, I did a lot of art history in college, and first went to Italy just to see all the things <coughs> I'd studied, you know, all the slides I'd seen of the great art, and to see these uh, in person. But I think the day I got there, we were sitting, sitting out in those arcades in Bologna having coffee, and it was such a vibrant scene. Everybody was visiting each other at different tables and laughing and smoking. And I, I said to the person I was with, these people are having more fun than we are. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just that immediate kind of connection with the vivacity of Italian life that I, I just fell for immediately. And still was the art. I mean, I, in the back of this book, when I'm trying to figure out why people are so generous and warm and, and why I have such a response, I think it goes back to the, my idea, my leap of an idea, that is because not only do they live in beauty, but they live with so much art. And art is a gift. You, you realize that walking around museums that these people have given you something. They, they've done it, they've worked, they've put their heart and soul and it's a gift to you. So this gift is all over Italy and it's taken for granted because they breathe it, it's there. And I think that, that they are given this gift of art and beauty makes a big difference in their lives and they feel more at home in the world. They don't feel as much strife here in any way. We've lived in the same house for 43 years. Is there something wrong with us? <laughs> 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 I think that's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> and it went down halfway through that time. No. Oh, just the same or different? Different. Uh -huh. Oh, good. That's wonderful. I, I look at people from my hometown who've done that same thing, and I always have you know, real admiration for that root, that sense of being there through all the changes and that being your place. I think to me the thing about a, a home is it's the place that inspires you if it's if it's the right home it it gives you something for maybe the person you started out to be but got waylaid along the way because life happens to you but in the right house the right place even if it's a rented place or whatever if it's place that inspires you to, to do what you really want to do. That's home. That's home. Somebody, I, I was, I've been reading a lot of Niall Williams, an Irish writer. He's such a wonderful writer. And I read today, is, and he said, home is where you dig. And that's what I thought at Chatwood, and I wanted to call him up and say, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming tonight.